Well, good morning, everybody. I uh, hope uh, this beginning of this kind of rainy day here in the Spokane area, you know, uh, greets you well. Um, uh, praying that uh, Vision Weekend was great for you. And also, you know, that we got a little challenge, you know, this uh, last weekend, didn't we, when it came to what does it look like to stand up in a bow down world? And so I uh, looked at um, the idea of, first of all, trust, you know, that our foundation is upon a God who's in control. That second, humility is our first avenue, you know, of what it looks like to stand up. And third is wisdom and praying for what godly wisdom actually truly looks like. And so uh, with that being said, we are jumping in, you know, once again. Uh, hey, by the way, Ruthie, congratulations. Ruthie is a ginormous Rams fan. So congratulations, Ruthie. You know, I know Ruthie's on here every single day and she's very, very excited, you know, that your Rams won the Super Bowl. So congratulations, Ruthie. Uh, with that to be and said, because I'm not super happy about it, and no, I'm just kidding. I was fine. I just, I was, I was glad it was a great game. Uh, we're jumping into Second Samuel chapter seven. Second Samuel chapter seven, and so uh, here's what we know: is that uh, you know, um, based on order, it's going to feel a little weird, but it looks like Second uh, Samuel chapter seven literally happens after Second Samuel chapter eight. And you'll understand that when we get to chapter 8, because all these wars and the places that David conquers, um, we now see a time of peace. So for some reason, it seems like, you know, one chapter should be in place of another. But that's all right. You know, it doesn't change the meaning or significance behind it all. So it says this, when King David was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all the surrounding enemies. That's why I say that, because, you know, we're going to talk about tomorrow, the next day, you know, the idea of how much that, you know, he's at war and all the wars that he's in. The king summoned Nathan the prophet. So here's one of the first examples we see the new prophet. You know, who is Nathan? Nathan, again, a prophet is someone who is the mouthpiece of God, who speaks on behalf of God, not necessarily, but sometimes, you know, uh, predictions of the future, which would be prophecy, you know, uh, which can come from a prophet as well. So here's somebody on behalf of the Lord. Look, David said, I am living in a beautiful cedar palace, but the ark of God is out there in a tent. So what he's saying is, I've just realized, look at what I have. And I know God hasn't asked me to do this, but I want to give back to God for what he's given to me. Why should I live in such an amazing place and God is living in this tabernacle. Um, you can read in other parts of the Bible exactly what the tabernacle was, where they went around in the desert and they were able to move the Ark of the Covenant and all the places, and they would just kind of be able to move it from, from place to place. And so he's thinking, wait a minute, if I'm the king and I get this, I know who really is on the throne. Let, maybe, let, let me then build something for him. Nathan replied to the king, go ahead and do whatever you have in mind for the Lord is with you. Now that is a great thing to say, but the problem is even as a prophet, it sounds good. It looks good. It's honoring. There's nothing sinful about it, but there is one mistake. And this is the mistake that I make as well. And that is Nathan nor David sought the Lord. They didn't seek the Lord, even if this was something that the Lord wanted or desired, even if it was to honor the Lord. And so, but that same night, the Lord said to Nathan, go and tell my servant, David, this is what the Lord has declared. Are you the one to build a house for me to live in? I have never lived in a house from the day I brought the Israelites out of Egypt until this very day. I have always moved from one place to another with a tent and a tabernacle as my dwelling. So first of all, he's saying, I'm not confined to a specific place or location, but when I was with you, when I was being represented as being with you, it was okay. I was moving from place to place. I never even asked for this. Yet no matter where I have gone with the Israelites, this is verse seven, I have never once complained to Israel's tribal leaders, the shepherds of my people. I've never asked them, why haven't you built me a beautiful cedar house? So now go and say to my servant, David, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies has declared. I took you from tending sheep in the pasture and selected you to be the leader of my people, Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have destroyed all your enemies before your eyes, which again, we'll talk about those enemies when we get to chapter eight. Now I will make your name as famous as anyone who has ever lived on the earth, and I will provide a homeland for my people, Israel, planting them in a secure place well, where they will, um, planting them in a secure place. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, I, for some reason, I lost place. Uh, putting them in a secure place where they will never be disturbed. Evil nations won't oppress them as they've done in the past. Starting from the time I appointed judges to rule my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all of your enemies. Now, why is God saying no? We don't know in this section, but the great part is other parts of the Bible reveal it. You know, and uh, God says no because David was a man of war. And God wants a man of peace to actually build his temple. Uh, we're going to see later on, you know, how God uh, allows David to actually gather all of the uh, supplies, even though he's not uh, commanded to build in order to prepare his Solomon would, his son would be the one to actually build the temple. In first Chronicles chapter 22 verses eight to 10 explains this it says, but the word of the Lord came to me saying, you David have shed much blood and have made great wars. You shall not build a house for my name because you have shed much blood on the earth in my sight. A son shall be born to you who shall be a man of rest. He shall build a house for my name. So he's talking about, you know, again, Solomon. Um, uh, the other one thing I want to mention is also in first, uh, Chronicles. Um, and so, uh, God gave him a reason, you know, to be able to do it. And he just wanted to honor him. And then it says this though, here's, what's really, really cool is that even though you're not going to build a house for me, so I mean, I want you to just really feel the graciousness of God, David's heart is to do something for God, is to build something on behalf of God, is to proclaim his name above all. And God is so gracious, he flips it around and says, I'm going to give you some things. You know, I need you to understand how much, you know, uh, uh, I'm going to work in you and through you. Uh, verse 11, furthermore, the Lord declares that he will make a house for you, a dynasty of kings, for when you die and are buried with your ancestors, I will raise up one of your descendants, your own offspring, and I will make his kingdom strong. He is the one who will build a house, a temple for my name, and I will secure his royal throne forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. If he sins, I will correct and discipline him with the rod like any father would do. But my favor will not be taken from him as I took it from Saul, which I removed from your sight. Your house and your kingdom will continue before me for all time, and your throne will be secure forever. So Nathan went back to David and told him everything that the Lord said in this vision. Now, what he's saying there is, because uh, we know that over time, the literal kingdom of Israel gets taken out of David's you know, descendants. Uh, if you're in our series even right now, you know, you're seeing that there's different descendants as we get to the book of Daniel that are, that are on the throne that are not from David's line. But here's what we do know. The line of David would lead to the birth of Jesus. You know, and so understand this. This is why we read in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 7. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of peace. His government and his peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice. Notice this from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. <clears throat> or you might remember when the angel, you know, came and visited Mary. You will conceive, and this is Luke chapter 1, 31, and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor, David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. So God's promise and fulfillment through the line of David is that David's kingdom would never end. And it's never going to end because it's through the line and lineage of Jesus that uh, he is born and that he gives to us as well. So that's really, really kind of cool to be able, you know, to see, you know, um, in that circumstance and at that time. And then it says this, then King David went in and sat before the Lord and he prayed, who am I? Sovereign Lord, and what is my family that you have brought me thus far? And now, Sovereign Lord, in addition to everything else you speak of giving your servant a lasting dynasty, do you deal with everyone this way, O Sovereign Lord? 
Nope. Uh, what more can I say to you? You know what your servant is really like, Sovereign Lord, because of your promise and according to your will, you have done all these great things and have made them known to your servant. How great you are, O Sovereign Lord. There is no one like you. You know, a sovereign just you know, again means in ultimate control. He knows all in all and through all. We have never even heard of another God like you. What other nation on earth is like your people Israel? What other nation, O oh God, have you redeemed from slavery to be your own people? That would be us later on in history. You have made a great name for yourself when you redeemed your people from Egypt or redeemed us from our sins. You performed awesome miracles and drove out the nations that and gods that stood in their way. He's referring again to Pharaoh and the, 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 the plagues you know, that took place when Moses went and released the people. You made Israel your very own people forever and you, O oh Lord, became their God. And now, O oh Lord God, I am your servant. Do as you have promised concerning me and my family. Confirm it as a promise that will last forever. And may your name be honored forever so that everyone will say the Lord of heaven's armies is God over Israel. And may the house of your servant David continue before you forever, which it will through the name of Jesus. O Lord of heaven's armies, God of Israel, I have been bold enough to pray this prayer to you because you have revealed all this to your servant saying, I will build a house for you, a dynasty of kings. For you are God, O sovereign Lord, your words are truth and you have promised these good things to your servant. And now may it please you to bless the house of your servant so that it may continue forever before you. For you have spoken and when you grant a blessing to your servant, O sovereign Lord, it is an eternal blessing, which it is. The eternal blessing that you and I have in Jesus Christ is predicated, it's prophesied, and it's lived out through what we've just read now. And so I pray that on this day, you and I would also find ourselves grateful to God for the everlasting covenant that we have with him that started all the way back to David. And before that, it was to Abraham. And before that, it was in the Garden of Eden, you know, Eden, you know, even that's a whole different conversation, you know. And so I pray that today, you know, you and I would be grateful for the lineage that we too share you know, that goes all the way back from a spiritual sense to be a part of a dynasty and a kingdom that will never end. As sons and daughters of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, may that bring encouragement and perspective on this day. And then finally, as we should show our gratitude in the same way that David did as well. What are ways that we can honor the Lord? What are ways that we can lift his name as he chooses to use and work through us in amazing ways. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much. This is your day. We love you. We thank you. We thank you for the dynasty that truly is still being lived out forever and ever through David and then through Jesus and now through us in the opportunities and lives, a part of a kingdom that will never end. We love you and thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey guys, have a wonderful rest of your day and I will see you again tomorrow morning. We will be in 2 Samuel chapter 8 if you want to get, uh, get ahead on that. Love you guys.